Okay, so obviously this temperature that particles can deform is a, is a specific temperature, right? They have to be soft. And if they're not soft, you'll get this, this nice colloidal crystal formation. And you can imagine if you just have hot ping pong balls next to each other, the, the end result will be really brittle. So you, you can't really use it as a binder material. So, and the temperature at which you go from like a crusty white film, because obviously, why would the film be white if my particles are hot? Well, white, if, if they're monodispersed, you can have nice Bragg diffraction, but if they're not monodispersed, the film would still be white. Why would it be white if I have polydispersed hot spheres that I dry out? Why does it look white? Anybody? Total silence. So it's like, because there's a difference in refractive index between the sphere, sphere and the air gaps. Yeah, so you have air gaps there, and because of the difference in refractive index, you get scattering, and the gaps are on the, roughly the same size as uh, well, no, the spheres. A bit smaller, but in, in the visible region, you will get light scattering. And as a result of that, it appears white, because scattering is in every, in every single direction. So if the, the spheres are monodispersed, you have this band gap on top of it, which is Bragg diffraction. But nevertheless, so you'll go from an opaque film to a transparent film, because if the particles are pushed together, you, you lose those interstitial air gaps, and effectively you don't get scattering anymore. So, so that temperature where it starts, where that has to happen, is called the minimum film formation temperature. So either the MFT or the MFFT, depending on what paper um, you hit. So if the interstitial voids are way smaller than the wavelength of light, it doesn't scatter anymore or scatters way less, so then it looks clear. And if your particles start to auto here, so slightly after that, so when they start to fuse together, you don't get cracks anymore. So as in cracks, mud cracks. Yeah? So you, don't, you can't break the material anymore. So if the temperature is way above the minimum film formation temperature, you get a nice homogeneous film. If it's below, you end up with an opaque system that's very brittle, and has lots of cracks in it. And it's obviously, for those applications, not uh, particularly interesting. So the minimum film formation temperature scales with the glass transition temperature of the system. So you've learned, hopefully, in polymer chemistry, year two or in year three, that the glass transition temperature of a, bicom of a binary system uh, could be predicted with the flory fox equation, which is given here. So if you would do a copolymerization of styrene and butyl acrylate, for example, 50-50 mixture, one over the Tg of that combined system would be the weight fraction of styrene divided by the glass transition temperature of styrene. What's the glass transition temperature of styrene? Polystyrene, sorry. Anybody uh, view on this? Think about uh, coffee cups. They're made out of polystyrene. So it must be relatively high, right? Because otherwise you melt your coffee cup. So it's about 100 degrees, 105, yeah? And then butyl acrylate is really soft. We saw that before. It's minus 54. Uh, you have to put the numbers in in Kelvin, not in degrees Celsius. Now, otherwise it doesn't add up. And then you can predict it. So roughly 50-50 mixture will be about zero. So at room temperature, you're above MFT, which is good. So it, it fuses, but not super sticky. Yeah, because the butyl acrylate is a sticker material. And if you, around zero at room, a room temperature application is good for paint. Yeah, so at least this wall doesn't feel sticky. If this would be pure butyl acrylate, you get a pretty sticky mess, basically. It attracts lots of dust, and you don't really want that. So, so you can tune that. Now, for those who have forgive, forgotten what a glass transition temperature is, here's a little <coughs> recap. So, um, so if you look at molar volume and you plot it as a function of temperature in the graph over here, um, and if you start in the liquid state, so you're at point A, and you can cool down, you cool down with a certain slope. So basically, the value of that slope is a measure for your, well, expansion, your heat, um, your volumetric expansion. 
So why why do why is that positive slope? Why does the molar volume go up of a liquid if you heat it up? Because it moves faster, right? So you get more energy and it goes bigger, bigger, bigger. So uh, so then I cool down. I, I reach point B, and then uh, let's assume the liquid can crystallize. So I crystallize, and all li well most liquids, apart from the one that spoils the party, water, uh, you get a drop. Yeah. So the crystals are more dense than the corresponding liquid. So we're not talking about water. So so then I'm point C, and then I lower the temperature and I get another uh, expansion coefficient there. And that slope is lower than the slope of the liquid. So why does a material shrink if I cool it down? Further, a solid. Why does a solid crystalline material shrink? Yeah, exactly. The same reason, less movement. So if you're a crystal, you vibrate, right? You can. So you expand if you uh, vibrate a lot. And if you can't vibrate very much anymore, then you contract. So, so this is a generic picture. And then the, the, the thermodynamic transition is first order. So when you start to melt, suddenly you get a massive volume expansion. All right. Now, this is what you do if you go from a crystalline state to a glassy state. You're going to do the same experiment. You start at point A. Now I'm going to cool down very fast. So I don't have time to crystallize, basically. So, and then at point B, I lose so much energy that I no longer have translational energy left, which means suddenly I'm a solid. And I'm a glassy solid. So that particular point D is called the glass transition temperature. Now here's a fun rule. Every material that can crystallize will, by definition, have a glass transition temperature. And there are obviously also materials that will have a glass transition temperature that cannot crystallize. So water has got a melting point and, by definition, also a glass transition temperature. And the glass transition temperature of water at atmospheric pressure is minus 135 degrees Celsius. The trick is to cool down so fast that I can't form my crystals. And then you'll end up what some people call vitreous ice or amorphous solid water. And that actually is used in uh, cryo electron microscopy. So cryo -tem, if you get crystalline structures and you hit it with an electron beam, you get a diffraction pattern, so it's useless. So you want to have amorphous ice, otherwise you can't image. And people then cool down in liquid ethane, so you cool down very, very fast, you get no crystal formation. So, so the rule is Tg always lower than a melting point. And for some materials that are semi-crystalline, like polymers, some polymers can crystallize. You have an amorphous phase and a crystalline phase. If you go above the Tg, stuff can recrystallize. So but that goes a little bit uh, further than we need for this. The glass transition temperature is time dependent. So it's not a secondary order thermodynamic transition. So it's also the reason why all polymeric amorphous materials shrink over time. So you see that the amorphous state, by definition, has a, a higher molar volume and therefore a lower density than the equivalent um, crystalline material. And they, over time, you know, they are frozen in, but since frozen in is time dependent, I can't move on the length scale of seconds. I can move on the length scale of decades, you will get movement in a glassy type of material. Um, so that basically means that E wants to become F at a certain temperature, which means you shrink, which means that, for example, a plastic hard valve over a 10-year period shrinks with 2 to 3%, and you get a leak, and you don't want that, and that's why these things need to be replaced. So, okay, so this is... The same reason, obviously, your TG, if you freeze in uh, fast or slow, uh, changes. Okay, so that was a bit on TG. So we have to be above the TG in order to deform particles. So what, 
zap back to the first stage of this film formation process. And you saw in that movie clip that the particles moved to the side. So if you look at the picture here, so where water evaporates the fastest, you get a, you know, there's no, you have a, not enough water there. So you get a water flux, an active flux, so water transport towards the place where evaporation is fastest. And as a result of that, the particles just move along with it because you get convective flow. So if you would have a droplet, the droplet evaporates the fastest on the edges of the droplet. And as a result of this, all the particles move towards the edge. That is, if they have enough drag force in convective flow. So spherical particles do this quite perfectly. So that's also the reason why, for example, if you have a, a drop of coffee that you spill on a piece of paper or a blanket, then you have the coffee stain effect. You always end up with a ring because all the suspended matter in there flows towards the edges, dries out, so you get an enrichment of particles there. There's not very many, so that's why the intensity on the outside is, is larger than the intensity on the inside. Apparently, I didn't put that reference on here, but there's a nice science paper from half a year ago that that doesn't happen for ellipsoidal particles. For, so that's quite interesting. But uh, so apart from that, you get convective flow in that particular stage, water evaporation, and you can clearly see that the film dries out from the outside towards the inside. So here you see uh, pictures at different stages of one of these films. So you'll see the outside looks crispy in this case. The inside a bit bluish because of the water is still there. And over time, you clearly see that the water layer just you know, goes more and more towards the middle where the film uh, would have until it's eventually dried out. So that's the first bit, flow directed assembly. You can make use of this to really assemble particles very nicely uh, on purpose. Now, now is a puzzle. So you have a deformation of particles, right? So they've all packed together, and now I start to deform them. And uh, you can get, obviously, depending on how they're packed together, you can get different arrangements. So I'm going to push them together so they go from spherical to polyhedral. And now the trick is to identify which kind of polyhedral shape you'll have for what kind of arrangement. So let's, uh, let's have a look. So here's a nice one. This is a, a fractured uh, TAM image of particles that just have deformed, but they're not interpenetrated yet. And then we break the surface, and we have a look. So the question is, is this face-centered cubic or body-centered cubic? packing. So it's a bit like a... So people made their mind up or... I, should, I need my clickers now, right? Uh, Andy Clark needs to give my clickers back. But hey ho. So uh, everybody made their mind up for themselves? Yeah? Right, I'll reveal the answer. BCC was the right answer. Um, so I'll show you the FCC one in a bit. You can, you can kind of look at, you know, if you look at the flat planes on top, you can see there's like one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight things around it. And effectively direct, directly touching would be like in the same plane would be four because you just jump a plane up every single time, yeah? So, and BCC packing sometimes happens if you have some, some pressure uh, systems that are not arranged perfectly well. So here you see uh, some additional STM images of particles that are arranged in the same format. So they, you know, it's like square type of arrangement. So if you do FCC, this is the FCC packing, but there's a mistake. And the mistake is called the Schottky effect. So now the trick is find a mistake. So a mistake means there's a particle missing. So at one place in this image, it went wrong.
So, okay, so you can see, like, there, <laughs> it went wrong. Yeah, so that's like in the middle on the, on the Z scale and about uh, two-thirds in on the right. So, so but you can, you can clearly see that, you know, this type of arrangement is a different confirmation that you had before, and uh, which then relates to FCC packing. So it's quite nice to see these particles deform. And the reason is that the last bit of water, because of the curvature of the interface, the capillary under pressure is so large that you can easily push this, these things together. Actually, even if you would have hard particles, in, if you would have hard polystyrene spheres, and you dry them out in a TAM image, you see that they have these butts that they touch each other and it overlaps a bit because the pressure has become so enormous for the last bit of water that even if you're far under the TG, you can just, with high pressures, you just can melt. Uh, well, melt is the wrong word. You can get it into the liquid state so you can deform it. So, but obviously not on a, on a macroscopic scale, but it's very, very powerful, this capillary under pressure. So it can easily deform these particles. So once they are deformed, you don't have this pressure thing left anymore. And then you're relying on natural diffusion, which is, which is a way slower process. So imagine the particle is a bunch of spaghetti chains. And then the other one is now flat against it, which is also a bunch of spaghetti chains. These spaghetti chains move on a very long time scale, so they interpenetrate to the left and the other particle to the right, and you get one big interpenetrating mesh as the end result. And this can take days, if not weeks, if not months, and as a result of that, your mechanical properties will change. So the end result is nicely bulk homogeneous, but obviously you can imagine if you've just made your film fresh and you don't have a lot of polymer-polymer interpenetration anymore, the mechanical properties are relatively weak because you can just pull these things apart. So, and therefore, quite often people use uh, additional tricks to cross-link the system chemically in order to reinforce the mechanical properties. So this is what you guys have all done last year, apart from if you were ill on that day or you went shopping and you self-certified yourself. So, uh, but, uh, so, yeah, waterborne paints, are made uh, via this way, and there's a bunch of ingredients. So uh, the binder in this particular case is uh, your soft polymer latex in water. Your main pigment in almost all cases will be titanium dioxide. Um, why, why titanium dioxide? Yeah, refractive index. Refractive index of titanium dioxide is very high. The larger the difference in refractive index, the more scattering, therefore the more opacity, therefore the more white, whiter than white. So what's a little trick that uh, you can use a little trick to make it even whiter than white? What's a little trick? They use it in toothpaste. They use it in, uh, in uh, white laundry detergent formulations. It only works for humans. They perceive it whiter than white. Yeah, add a little bit of blue. So... Uh, so quite often they use a copper phthalocyanine, which is blue, add a bit of blue, so it looks whiter. So if your white wash doesn't look white anymore, put a blue t-shirt in it. And then it looks whiter than before, unless it transfers a lot of blue, then you're in trouble, obviously. So, okay, so that's the main pigment, and then you have some other stuff in there. So let's go through the different uh, bits that are in there. So, uh, so titanium dioxide quite is... At the moment, it's a massive problem, two big problems. You have to hack it out of the ground. It's very energy intensive. Um, and the, the, the current prices on the market are skyrocketing, skyrocketing. So it's not the same as gold, but it's getting uh, quite disturbingly high. So paint companies are very much looking forward to replacing it with something else because the carbon footprint is very high, not very green, and uh, the, the, the prices are, are well, going through the roof at the moment. So they want to put cheap stuff in there, basically, and there's a lot of cheap stuff. So calcium carbonate, and you could even argue carbonate is CO2, so you do CO2 storage on your wall. Uh, you can do magnesium carbonate, or you can use clays. So on the right-hand side, you see kaolin clays. They're way cheaper. The problem with all of these things is that they don't have the same high refractive index. But then sometimes you can use tricks. 
So sometimes clay uh, can be used as a as a trick because it it can introduce if you go above certain concentrations, it stacks like a card house, and you can have air gaps in between. If you have air gaps in between, then you suddenly you have a large difference in refractive index. So you could uh, you could play with that a little bit. So all kinds of things are on the market. So they use, for example, so-called P3 is precipitated calcium carbonate. So, uh, so there's a few pictures of these things. So depending on what paint you buy, the price gets determined of one, how much water is in there? Because obviously most paint formulations are between 50 and 60, 65% solids. If you go for a cheap one, you have 20% solids and then you realize you have to paint your room two or three times. Whereas the more expensive one, you only have to do it once. And then obviously the more expensive ones will have more titanium dioxide in there because it's a better opacifying agent. So you will gain quite a lot for buying the expensive one and not the cheap one. Okay, so other stuff is in there. So there's some shear thickeners in there. So um, shear thickeners means that, uh, well, you basically start to play with uh, viscosity and you have some thixotropic agents in there. So what you want is that, at, you know, at, at high shear, you want to be able to apply your system, but at medium at low shear, you want to have a relatively thick viscosity because otherwise it drips down your wall. So you don't really want that. So there's a fine balance between how to play with uh, rheology and viscosity of this. Then they chuck in that molecule over there, bronopol, which is in a lot of uh, organic stuff. And this basically kills any bacteria. So it uh, doesn't look very nice, obviously but uh, it is in there. And then some surfactants in order to disperse all these clay platelets and titanium dioxide to keep the entire system colloidally stable. So typically they have some polycarboxylic acids in there. So polycarboxylic acid, the carboxylic acid group interacts with surfaces quite well. So it absorbs quite nicely uh, on uh, calcium, on, on metal oxide surfaces. And then in the, in the, in the solution, it has both steric stabilization and electrostatic stabilization. And then they add some non-ionics there to gain more uh, steric stabilization. So it's, it's less susceptible towards salt, which is very important because remember, if you, dry, if you dry your water out, your salt concentration goes up. And if you then start to coagulate your system, you'll end up with yogurt on your wall and not with a nice uh, homogeneous film. So it's quite important you get that right. And then obviously a foaming agent, they put an anti-foaming agent in there. So if someone is a little bit too enthusiastic with its paintbrush, you don't get a lot of bubbles in there. And if there is bubbles in there, you can remove it quite easily. So typically for that, they use silica or mineral oil, which breaks up bubbles really easily. So, so this is uh, one of the uh, important parameters in, uh, in paint, and it's called the pigment volume concentration. So, uh, which basically uh, there's a threshold value in there. So if it's zero PVC, there are no pigments in there, which means there's only a binder in there, which means you end up with a transparent film. So it's a varnish type of thing. Yeah. So below your critical PVC, you'll have uh, pigment particles, which are red in this case, dispersed throughout the continuous matrix of plastic binder material. As a result of that, you have a pretty good a pretty good um, penetration barrier, um, so it's sealed. Therefore, you have good durability, and you have high sheen, so it's quite glossy, because the transparent bit is quite glossy. And if you have roughness, you start to diffract stuff, and you, you lose gloss, basically. So then you have a critical PVC, and there's just enough binder to disperse all these particles nicely. And if you go above it, you don't have enough, and you get holes in it. Now these holes sometimes can be very useful because you get a higher refractive index. Yeah? And a higher refractive index means I can lower my titanium dioxide concentration, which means I can make a cheaper paint. However, your resulting film as a result of this is very porous. So if it rains outside and it freezes overnight, then you get volume expansion thanks to water and ice. And then you just basically break your entire film away. 
So there is some uh, indoor outdoor issues with that. And um, the result of that, because of this roughness, you also get low gloss. So the trick is, if you want to use a matte coating, not shiny, you're above critical PVC, put a lot of clay in there and other stuff. And if you want to have glossy coating, you put more binder in there and you'll end up with a nice glossy paint. So here, you don't have to remember this, but here is uh, typically how these things are made. So last year you picked one of these, I think. So you made a TIO2 slurry. So typically what people do is they make a, they disperse um, the titanium dioxide in water with several surfactants and then uh, um, an anti-foam agent. And you'll end up, like you've seen that last year, right? You end up with a very, very thick slurry at 55% solids. And you can do the same thing with clay. And clay is fun because because it stacks like a card house, the bulk density is really low, but the, the, the actual density of the clay plate is, is relatively high, it's about 2.6. But obviously because it's a fluffy stacked thing, it's not very dense. The bulk density is like 0 0.3 or 0 0.4. So you can get a lot in a tiny little bit of water. Um, and then uh, you mix these things then with the binder and then your film, your film is ready really. So, uh, so this is typically what they do. So binder materials for, um, that's quite a nice shift actually. So at the moment, uh, well, traditionally people use styrene butadiene because it was cheap. Butadiene is cheap. By butadiene, you have a little bit of uh, pendant groups left, vinyl groups left, which you could use because you could crosslink the system. So that's good. The bad thing is it also yellows. And now recently, about the last two years, butyl acrylate is way cheaper than butadiene. So people have replaced that. And with, if, you, uh, if you use acrylate-based lattices, then you get way better uh, properties than in case of butadiene. So butadiene is still used in paper manufacturing, cheap stuff, whereas glossy paint on the wall is either styrene with butyl acrylate or some vinyl acetate-based uh, type of systems. So, well, here is, uh, so you've made your slurries, and on this slide, uh, you can basically see how you mix these things together. So you get uh, your different slurries that you add in in different masses and you add your latex. And so these are typical five different paint formulations from glossy all the way to matte. So, and this is typically what, what paint manufacturers like Axo Nobel do. They get all these ingredients, they mix and match until they get a nice smooth formulation. So they do hundreds and hundreds and hundreds variety with a robot to check which one's the best. Can I get a little bit more gloss? Can I use less titanium dioxide? Don't I have any grains in there? What are my, my long-term mechanical properties? So that's quite... Uh... Actually, one of the guys that's now doing his placements, he is an Axe Nobel, and he does this with a, with a high-speed, well, high-speed, relatively high-speed mixing robot. You make lots of paint steels, and then you can analyze how these things, uh, what the best and the cheapest formulation is to get what you want. 